Okay, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that all of you showed up. I, you know, uh, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to be reading a, a short story, uh, uh, The Fastest Runner on 61st Street by James T. Farrell. Uh, the, the, the short story takes place in 1919, the summer of 1919, in Chicago. And so that was an, a very auspicious moment in American history. And so I wanted to spend just a few minutes telling you about that summer and Chicago in that summer. In the summer of, of 1919, there were about three dozen what you could call race riots, but that doesn't quite say it was, it was white mobs attacking black communities in cities across the country. Three dozen, and uh, Chicago was one of them. The Chicago race riot of 1919 was one of the seminal moments of that period, and it has since been relatively buried in American history, just like, unbelievably, Tulsa, which was only three years later. Wilmington, North Carolina, at the very end of the 19th century, and many others. Uh, two years before that, uh, East St. Louis, uh, 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 Illinois, just across the river from St. Louis, uh, was practically destroyed by a white mob against black people. In Elaine, Arkansas, uh, the same month that, that Chicago blew up, uh, uh, some black sharecroppers were organizing to try to get more money for their crops, and that so enraged the white community, it was the white plantation owners community, and they had power that there was a massive attack on black uh, 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 sharecroppers, and between one and two hundred of them were killed. So this was, a, this was a mean summer. It was the first summer after the war had ended, and uh, 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 so we were in the midst of demobilization. Many of the black troops that came home were trained, militarily trained, and I didn't find this out until I was reading for this presentation that uh, a large number of black troops that served in World War I were in French units under French command because the white officers didn't want to be the officers in charge of black units. But the result of that was that these troops in particular who came back were treated as equals during the war by whites in World War I, and they were in no mood to just sit back and say, yes, ma'am. So in addition to that, there was widespread labor unrest. Just two years before the Russian Revolution had occurred, we were afraid of communist influence. We had anarchists throwing bombs in 1919, uh, and uh, major strikes. The steel strike of 19 was one of the largest strikes in American history and was uh, brutally put down. And those two things melded together because leftists were generally in favor of uh, civil rights. And so leftists tended to be champions of uh, black liberation. <laughs> and so the result was that all of the, the fear and the anger that was directed at labor activism washed off into racial difficulty as well. Now, I don't, I don't suppose that any of you here, I'm sure I could get, get some money on this, uh, know who Eugene Williams was. For the last hundred years, he has lain in a, an unmarked gra at grave in a Chicago cemetery. And just recently, and I mean very recently, July of this year, a local historian and some local activists in Chicago set out to find out where his grave was and they finally found it. It was amidst a number of graves that were all unmarked in a cemetery in Chicago. Eugene Williams on July 27th of 1919 set out with four of his buddies to have a good day in Lake Michigan. He was a black 17-year-old who just graduated the previous year, was working as a porter for, a, for a, a, a local railroad, not any of the, big, any of the biggies, 
And it became a thing in the summer in Chicago at that time for young people to build rafts. And, and he and his buddies had built this raft, and off they went. They went to the 25th Street entrance to the, to the, uh, the beach for Lake Michigan. Uh, and although there was no uh, uh, Jim Crow in Chicago legally, uh, there was an understanding. That was the Black Beach. <laughs> And just up the beach, the 29th Street entrance, four blocks away, was a white beach. And so they're out on the, on the raft diving into the water. And at one point, uh, uh, Eugene grabbed onto a railroad tie that was, that was in the water. And the current was running toward the 29th Street beach. And he inadvertently, there was no barrier there, he's in the water. Uh, he went into the white beach. It was just beyond a breakwater that went out into the beach and the uh, out into the water. And a a white immigrant by the name of uh, George Stauber picked up some rocks and started throwing them at the kids. And he hit Eugene right in the forehead, knocked him off his grip of the railroad tie, and he died. By this time, blacks from the 25th Street Beach entrance and all the whites to the 29th Street Beach were watching this go on. And the blacks immediately reported to the police that this is the guy who did it. And the white officer not only refused to arrest him, but he refused to allow a black officer to arrest him. And instead, they arrested a black man, who by this time must have been pretty pissed off. The result was a whole week of riots in which uh, 37 people were killed, 25 of them were black, about 550 were injured badly, and of the 550, uh, about 180 were white, all the rest were black. White gangs roamed the black neighborhoods and set fire to homes. And the result was that between one and 2,000 black people were without a home. One of the suspected leaders was a member of the Hamburg Athletic Club. Uh, his name was Richard Daly. Later became mayor of Chicago for many years, one of the most powerful men in America. And he never denied or admitted that he was part of that. But the Hamburg Athletic Club was well known as one of the most ferociously anti-black uh, youth organizations in Chicago. A couple of years later, he became its president. So this is the setting for The Fastest Runner on 61st Street by James T. Farrell. Morty Aiken liked to run and skate. He liked running games and races. He liked running so much that sometimes he'd go over to Washington Park all by himself and run just for the fun of it. He got a kick out of running. He'd raced every kid that he could find to run against him. His love of racing and running had even become a joke among many of the boys he knew, but even when they gave him a horse laugh about it, it was done in a good-natured way because he was a very popular boy. Older fellows liked him, and when they'd see him, they'd say, there's a damn good kid and a damn fast runner. When he passed his 14th birthday, Morty was a trifle smaller than most of the boys his own age, but he was well-known and, in a way, almost famous in his own neighborhood. He lived at 61st and Eberhardt, but kids in the whole area had heard of him, and many of them would speak of what a runner and what a skater Morty Aiken was. He won medals in playground tournaments, and in fact, he was the only lad in the school who had ever won medals in these tournaments. In the playground tournaments, he became the champion in the 50 and 100-yard dash, and this got him the reputation of being the best runner for his age on the whole south side of Chicago. And he was a fast skater, as fast as he was a runner. In winter, he was regularly and almost daily to be seen on the ice of the Washington Park Lagoon or over on the Midway. He had a pair of Johnson racers, which his father had given him, and he treasured these more than any other possession. His mother knitted him red socks. 
and a red stocking cap for skating. And he had a red and white sweater. And when he skated, he was like a streak of red. And his sense of himself and of his body on the ice was sure and right. And almost every day, there'd be a game of I got it. And the skater who had it would skate in a wide circle, chased by a whole pack until he was caught. And Morty loved to play I got it. And on many a day, this boy in short pants, wearing a red stocking cap and a red and white sweater and the thick knitted red woolen socks coming above the black hose shoes of his Johnson racers, would lead the pack, circling round and round and round, his head forward, his upper torso bent forward, his hands behind his back, his legs working with grace and giving him a speed which seemed almost miraculous. And in February of 1919, Morty competed in an ice derby conducted under the auspices of the Chicago Clarion. He won two gold medals. His picture was on the first page of the sports section of the Sunday Clarion. And all in all, he was a famous and celebrated lad. His father and mother were proud of him. His teachers and Mrs. Bixby, the principal of the school, were proud of him. Merchants on 61st Street were proud of him. There wasn't a lad in the neighborhood who was greeted on the street by strangers as often as Morty. Now, although he was outwardly modest, Morty had his dreams. He graduated from grammar school in 1919 and was planning to go to Park High in the fall. He was impatient to go to high school and to get into the high school track meets. He'd never been coached, and yet look how good he was. What wouldn't he be if he had some coaching? He'd be a streak of lightning if there ever was one. He dreamed that he'd be called the human streak of lightning. And after high school, why, there'd be college, college track meets and the Big Ten Championship. And after that, he'd join an athletic club and run in track meets. And he'd win a place on the Olympic team. And somewhere, you know, Paris or Rome or some European city, he'd beat the best runners in the world. And like Ty Cobb in baseball and Jess Willard in prize fighting, He'd be the world's champion runner. And the girls would all like him. And the most beautiful girl in the world would marry him. He liked girls, but girls liked him even more than he liked them. In May, a little while before his graduation, the class had a picnic and they, they played post office. The post office was behind a clump of bushes in Jackson Park. He was called to the post office more than any of the other boys, and there was giggling and talking and teasing, but it hadn't bothered him, especially because he knew that the other fellows liked and kind of envied him. To Morty, this was only natural. He accepted it. He accepted the fact that he was a streak of lightning with his feet and on the ice, and that made him feel somehow different from other boys and very important. Even Tony Robusky looked at him in this way. And if any kid would have picked on him, Tony would have piled into that kid. Tony was the toughest kid in school, yeah, and he was also considered to be the dumbest. He was also the poorest. Often he came to school wearing a black shirt because a black shirt didn't show the dirt the way the other shirts did, and his parents couldn't afford to buy him any shirts. One day, Tony was walking away from school with Morty, and Tony said, Kid, you run the fastest. But I'm the best, the best in the whole school. We make up a crap team. We're pals. Shake, kid. We're pals. And so Morty shook Tony's hand. For a 14-year-old boy, Tony had very big, strong hands. The other kids side sometimes called them meat hooks. Morty looked on his, head, on his handshake as a pledge. He and Tony became friends, and they were often together. Morty had Tony come over to his house to play. Sometimes Tony stayed for a meal, and Tony ate voraciously and wolfishly. When Morty's parents spoke of the way Tony ate and of the quantity of food he ate, Morty would reply by telling him, Tony's my friend. Because he was poor and somewhat stupid, uh, a dull and fierce resentment smoldered in Tony. Other boys out-talked him and they were often able to plague and, ignore and annoy him and then outrun him because he was heavy-footed. The kids used to laugh at Tony because they said he had lead, iron, and bricks in his feet. After they'd shaken hands and became pals, 
Morty never would join the other boys in razzing Tony, and he and Tony doped out a way that would permit Tony to get even. If some of the boys made game of Tony until he was confused and enraged and he went for them, Morty would chase the boys. He had no difficulty in catching one of them, and when he caught one of the boys who'd been teasing and annoying Tony, he'd usually manage to hold the boy until Tony would lumber up and exact his punishment. Sometimes Tony would be cruel, and on a couple of occasions when Tony, in a dull, stupefied rage, was sitting on a hurt, screaming boy and pounding him, Morty ordered Tony to lay off, and Tony did so instantly. Morty didn't want Tony to be too cruel. He'd come to like Tony and to look upon him as a, as a big brother. He'd always wanted a brother. Sometimes he'd imagine how wonderful it would be if Tony could even come to live at his house. The system Morty and Tony worked out with Morty chasing and catching one of the boys who ragged Tony worked out well. Soon, the kids stopped ragging Tony because of their fear and because they liked and respected Morty and wanted him to play with them. They began to accept Tony, and Tony began to change. Once accepted so that he was no longer the butt of jokes, he looked on all the boys in Morty's gang as his pals. He'd protect them just as he would protect Morty. Tony had used to scowl and make fierce and funny faces and act in many odd little ways. But after he became accepted, as a result of being Morty's pal, his behavior changed, and because he was strong and he could fight, the boys began to admire him. At times, he really hoped for strange boys to come around the neighborhood and act like bullies so he could beat them up. He wanted to fight and punch because he could feel powerful and he could be praised and admired. And that helped him think more of himself. Ever since he'd been a little fellow, Tony had been called a Pollock or a dirty Pollock. After he became one of the gang or group around Morty, some of the boys would tell him that he was a white Pollock. In his slow way, he thought about these words and what they meant, because when you were called certain words, you were laughed at, and you were looked at as if something was wrong with you. If you were a Pollock, and many girls didn't even want to have anything to do with you. The boys and girls who weren't Pollocks, they had fun together that Pollocks couldn't have. Being a Pollock and being called a Pollock was like being called a son of a bitch. It was a name. And when you were called names like this, you were looked at as a different kind of kid from somebody who wasn't called names. Morty Aiken wasn't called names. Tony didn't want to be called names either. And if he fought and beat up those who called him names, they'd be afraid of him. He wanted that. But he also wanted to have as much fun as the kids who weren't called these names. And he worked it out that these kids felt better when they called other kids names. He could fight. He could call names. And if he called a kid a name that kid got, and that kid got tough, he'd beat him up. He began to call other kids names. There was a name even worse than Pollock, nigger. If Tony didn't like a kid, he'd call him a nigger. And he called a, and he talked about the niggers. He felt as good as he guessed these other kids did when he talked about the niggers. And they could be beat up. They weren't supposed to go to Washington Park because that was a park for whites. That's what he'd often heard. He heard it said so much that he believed it. He sometimes got a gang of boys together, and they'd roam Washington Park looking for colored boys to beat up. Morty went with them, but he didn't particularly like to beat up anyone. But when they saw a colored kid and chased him, he'd always be in the lead, and he'd be the one that caught the colored boy. He could grab or tackle him, and by that time, the others would catch up, and he worked the same plan that he and Tony had worked out against other boys. And after they caught and beat up a colored boy while they'd all talk and shout and brag about what they'd done, and they'd talk about how they had each gotten in their licks and punches and kicks, and how fast Morty had run to catch that shine, and what a sock Tony had given him, and talking all together and strutting and bragging, they felt good and proud of themselves, and they talked about how the 61st Street boys would see to it that Washington Park would stay a white man's park. So this became more and more important to Tony. There were those names 
Pollock and Dirty Pollock and White Pollock. And if you could be called a Pollock, you weren't considered white. Well, when you beat him up, was he white or wasn't he white? They knew. After the way he clouded these black ones, how could the other kids not say that Tony Robusky wasn't white? They showed them all. That, that showed he was a hero. He was a hero as much as Morty Aiken was. Morty was a proud boy on the night that he graduated from grammar school in June of 1919. He had received his diploma. There was more applause in the auditorium than there was for any other member of the class. He felt good when he heard this clapping, but then he expected it. He lived in a world where he was somebody, and he was going into a bigger world where he'd still be somebody. He was a fine, frank-looking lad with dark hair, frank blue eyes, even and friendly features. He was thin but strong. He wore a new short pants blue serge suit with a belted coat, a white shirt, and white bow tie. His class colors, orange and black ribbons, were pinned on the lapel of his coat. He was scrubbed and washed and combed, and he was in the midst of an atmosphere of gaiety and friendliness. The teachers were happy. There were proud and happy parents and aunts and uncles and older sisters. The local alderman made a speech praising everybody and speaking of the graduating boys and girls as fine future Americans. And he declared that in their midst, there were many promising lads and lassies who would live to enjoy great esteem and success. And he also said that among this group, there was also one who promised to become a stellar athlete and who had already won gold medals and honors. And on that night, Morty's mother and father were very happy. They kept beaming with proud smiles. Morty was their only son. Mr. Aiken was a carpenter. He worked steadily and had saved his money so that the house he owned was now paid for. He and his wife were quiet living people who minded their own business. Mr. Aiken was tall and rugged, with swarthy skin, rough-hewn face, and the look and manner of a workman. He was a gentle but firm man, but he was inarticulate with his own son. He, he believed that a boy should have a good time in sports and should fight his own battles, and that boyhood, the best time of one's life, should be filled with happy memories. The mother was faded and maternal. She usually had little to say, and her life was dedicated to caring for her son and her husband and to keeping their home clean and orderly. She was especially happy to know that Morty liked running and skating because these weren't dangerous. Well, after graduation ceremonies, the father and mother took Morty home where they had cake and ice cream. The three of them sat together, eating these refreshments, quiet but happy. The two parents were deeply moved. They were filled with gratification because of the applause given their son when he walked forward on the stage to receive his diploma. They were raising a fine boy, and they could look people in the neighborhood right in the eye and know that they had done their duty as parents. The father was putting money aside for Morty's college education. He hoped that besides becoming a famous runner, Morty would become a professional man. So he talked to his son uh, and, and mother over the ice cream and cake, and the boy seemed to accept his father's plans. And as the father gazed shyly at Morty, he thought of his own boyhood on a Wisconsin farm and the long summer days there, and Morty had a whole summer before him. He would play and grow and enjoy himself. He wasn't a bad boy. He had never gotten into trouble. He wasn't the kind of boy who caused worry. It was fine. In August, there'd be his vacation, and they would all go to Wisconsin, and he'd go fishing with the boy. That evening, Morty's parents went to bed feeling that this was the happiest day of their lives. And Morty went to bed, happy, light-hearted boy, think of the summer vacation, which had just begun. The days passed. Some of the days were better than others. Some days there was little to do, and on other days there was a lot to do. Morty guessed that this was anyway, turning out to be as good as any other summer he could remember. Tony Robusky, he was working, delivering flowers for a flower merchant. 
but he sometimes came around after supper and the kids sat talking or playing on the steps of Morty's house or of another house in the neighborhood. Morty liked to play run sheep run because it gave him a chance to run. And also he liked the hiding and searching and the hearing of the signals called out and the excitement and the tingling and the fun when he'd be hiding perhaps under some porch and the other side would be near, maybe even passing right by. And he and the other kids with him, they would have to be so still. And he'd even try to hold his breath. And then finally, the signal for which he'd been waiting, run sheep, run! And the race, setting off, tearing away along the sidewalks across the streets, running like hell, like a streak of lightning, and feeling your speed in your legs and muscles and getting to the goal first. Summer was going by, and it was fun. There wasn't a lot of worry on his mind, and then there, there were his dreams. He dreamt of Edna Purcell, who had been in his class. She seemed sweet on him, and she was a wonderful girl. One night, she and some other girls came around, and they sat on the steps of Morty's house and played Tin Tin, and Morty had to kiss her. He did, with the kids laughing, and it, it seemed that something happened to him. He hadn't been shy when he was with girls, but, but, but now, when Edna was around, he'd be shy. Uh, she, she was wonderful. She, she was more than wonderful. When he did have the courage to talk to her, he talked about running and ice skating, and she told him that she knew what a runner and skater he was. Fast skater, such as he was, wouldn't want to even think of skating with someone like her. He said that he would, and that next winter, he'd teach her how to skate better. Immediately, he found himself wishing that it were already winter, and he would imagine himself skating with her, and he would imagine them walking over to Washington Park Lagoon, and they're coming home again, and, and, and he'd carry her skates, and when they breathed, they'd be able to see their breasts, and the, the weather would be cold and sharp and would make her red cheeks even redder, and they'd be alone walking home with the snow packed on the park, alone, the two of them walking in the park, with it quiet, so quiet you could hear nothing. And it would be like they were in another world, and then there in the quiet park with white snow all over it, he'd kiss Edna Purcell. He had kissed Edna, playing Tin Tin in post office, but he looked forward to the day that he got from her the kiss that would mean she was his girl, his sweetheart, and the girl who would one day be his wife, just like his mom was his dad's wife. And everything he dreamed of doing, all the honors he would get, all the medals and the cups he dreamed of winning, now all this would be for Edna. And she was also going to Park, to Park High. And he would walk to school with her and eat lunch with her and walk her home from school. And when he ran in high school track meets for Park High, Edna would be in the stands. And he would give her his medals. He wanted to give her one of his gold skating medals, but he didn't know how to go about asking her to accept it. No matter what Morty thought about, he thought about Edna at the same time. He thought about her every time he dreamed, and when he walked on streets in the neighborhood, he thought about her. When he went to Washington Park or swimming, he thought about Edna, Edna, just to think of her. Edna made everything in the world wonderfully wonderful. And thus the, sum, the summer of 1919 was passing for Morty. He sat on the curb with a group of boys and they were bored and restless. They couldn't agree about what game to play or where to go or to, or to do to amuse themselves. A couple of them wanted to play knife, but they gave it up. Morty suggested a race, but nobody would race him. They couldn't agree on playing ball. One boy suggested swimming, but no one wanted to go swimming. Several of the boys wrestled and a fight almost resulted. Morty sat by himself. He was thinking about Edna. He guessed he'd rather be with her than with these kids. He didn't know where she was. If he knew that she had gone swimming, he'd go swimming. He didn't know what to do with himself. If he only could find Edna and they would be able to do something together or to go somewhere like, like Jackson Park Beach with just the two of them, why, then, then he knew that today would be the day that he'd be able to find a way to give her one of his clarion gold medals. But he didn't know where she was. Tony Rebusky came with four tough-looking kids. Tony had lost his job. He said the niggers had jumped him when he was delivering flowers down on 47th Street, and he wanted his pals to stick by him. 
He told them what happened, but they didn't get it because Tony couldn't tell a story straight. Tony asked them, didn't they know what was happening? There were race riots and the beaches and Washington Park and the, the whole south side were full of dark clouds. And over on Wentworth Avenue, the big guys were fighting and the dark clouds were out after the whites. They didn't believe Tony, but Morty said it was in the newspapers and there were race riots. The bored boys became excited. They bragged about what they'd do if the jigs came over in their neighborhood. And Tony said that they had to get some before they got this far. And when asked where they were, Tony said, all over. So finally, they went over to Washington Park, picking up sticks and clubs and rocks on the way. The park was calm. Few whites were walking and strolling about. A lad of 18 or 19 lay under a tree with his head in the lap of a girl who was stroking his hair. Some of the kids smirked and leered as they passed by the couple. Morty thought of Edna and wished that he could take her to Washington Park and kiss her. There were seven or eight rowboats on the lagoon, but all of the occupants were white. The, sharp, the park sheep were grazing. Tony threw a rock at them, frightening the sheep, and they all ran, but no cop was around to shag them. They passed the boathouse, talking and bragging. They now believed the rumors which they themselves had made up. White girls and women were in danger. Anything might happen. A tall lad sat in the grass with a nursemaid. A baby buggy was near them. The lad called them over and asked them what they were doing with their clubs and rocks, and Tony said they were looking for niggers. The lad said he'd seen two near the goldfish pond and urged the boys to go and get the sons of bitches. Screaming and shouting, they ran to the goldfish pond. Suddenly, Tony shouted, Dark clouds! They ran. Two Negro boys near the goldfish pond had heard Tony's cry, and then the other cry, and they ran. Well, Morty was chasing them. All of them chased the boys. Morty was in the lead, running at the head of the screaming, angry pack of boys. He forgot everything except how well and how fast he was running. Images of Edna flashed in and out of his mind. If she could see him running, he was running beautifully. He'd catch them. He was gaining. Colored boys ran in a northwest direction. They crossed the drive that flanked the southern end of Washington Park ball field and Morty was stopped by a funeral procession. The other boys caught up with him, and when the funeral procession passed, it was too late to try to catch the colored boys that they had been chasing. Angry, bragging, they crossed over to the ball field and marched across it, shouting and yelling. They picked up about eight boys of their own age, three older boys of 17 or 18. The older lads said they knew where they'd find some shines. Now was the time to teach them their place once and for all. Led by the older boys, they emerged from the north end of Washington Park and marched down Grand Boulevard, still picking up men's and boys as they went along. One of the men who joined them had a gun. They screamed, looked in doorways for Negroes, believed everything anyone said about Negroes, and kept boasting about what they'd do if they found some. Dark clouds, Tony boomed. The mob let out. They crossed to the other side of Grand Boulevard and ran cursing and shouting after a Negro. Morty was again in the lead. He was out running the men and the older fellows. He heard them shouting behind him. He was running. He was running like the playground hundred-yard champion of the whole south side of Chicago. He was running like the future Olympic champion. He was running like he'd run for Edna. He was tearing along, pivoting out of the way of shocked, surprised pedestrians, running, really running. He was running like a streak of lightning. The Negro turned east on 48th Street. He had a, a, a start of a block. But Morty'd catch him. He turned into 48th Street. He tore along the center of the street. He began to breathe heavily, but he couldn't stop running now. He was out distancing the gang, and he was racing his own gang and the Negro he was chasing. Down the center of the street, about half a block ahead of him, the Negro was tearing away for dear life, but Morty was gaining on him, gaining. He was now about half a block ahead of his own gang. They screamed murderously behind him, and they encouraged him. He heard shouts of encouragement. Come on, Morty boy! a boy, Morty! He heard Tony's voice. He ran. 
the Negro turned into an alley just off Forestville. Morty ran. He turned into the alley just in time to see the fleeing Negro spurt into a yard in the center of the block. He gained more. He was way ahead of the white mob somewhere behind him. They were coming and yelling. He tore on. He had gained his second wind. He felt himself running, felt the movement of his legs, the muscles, felt his arms, felt the sensation of his whole body as he raced down the alley. Never had he run so swiftly. Suddenly, Negroes jumped out of the yards. He was caught and pinioned. His only thought was one of surprise. Before he even realized what had happened, his throat was slashed. He fell, bleeding. The Negroes disappeared feebly. He mumbled just once. Mother. He lay bleeding in the center of the dirty alley. And when the gang of whites caught up with him, they found him dead in the dirt and his own blood in the center of the alley. No Negroes were in sight. The whites surrounded his body. The boys trembled with fear. Some of them cried. One wet his pants. Then they became maddened, and they stood in impotent rage around the bleeding limp body of Morty Aiken, the fastest runner on 61st Street. Thank you.